Hello everyone, it is Irene Lyon here and welcome to this video. Welcome to this entire world of healing trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity. I am excited to talk about this topic today. Um, it was originally inspired when I was listening to a podcast where um, the gentleman was talking about the importance of not engaging in bad behavior. Now, I'm not going to get into what bad behavior is and define that, but it had to do with things that we do in our lives, usually obviously in our past, that stick with us, that maintain with us, and then are really hard to break out of. Now, I'm going to speak to this from a nervous system, somatic, trauma, um, full body connection to the environment perspective today. Um, I'll share the anecdote that this podcaster was sharing, um, and it's no hit against them, and I'm not going to name who it is. It's just um, a great example of how many people still feel that we are doomed and hardwired with certain behaviors and emotions and afflictions, and it's just not the case. And I'll give you a few examples and other resources that you can check out. But I made some notes. It's not like me to have notes during these uh, videos, but I wanted to read um, a few thoughts that I have and I'm gonna break them down. So the first thing is this, we are only hardwired to the degree in which the various therapies and practical modalities we know about or have access to, I might add, can help. Not to mention our understanding of the entire human experience, human system, and how it works. So that's number one. Number two, we are more than our behavior. So if we only know how to work at the level of behavioral change, then yes, one will assume based on their knowledge that we are indeed hardwired. Now, the one thing that I have learned in all of my trainings with my mentors and working with students and clients and in private practice, all that stuff, is that our behavior is driven by our biology. I'm gonna say that one more time. Our behavior is driven by biology, by our biology. And um, when we work with folks in my work, in my programs, private practice, all of that, usually the behavior is the last thing to change when someone is living with, let's just say, um, some form of addiction or anxiety or behavior that's just not useful for them and is maybe there because they had to change them sh themselves to cope with an unsafe environment. Um, things like OCD, for example, um, are seen as behaviors and they are, so obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, however, it's driven by biology. It's driven by this autonomic nervous system that is trying to find order that's trying to make meaning that's trying to make sense of the world i'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because there's a lot there um, i'll see if i can pull out some other um, resources of mine where i talk about behavior ocd and certain things that we deem as strictly behavioral but really underlying that is dysregulation at the autonomic nervous system level okay the next thing i wanted to say um some things are hardwired so i have got brown hair. I have brownish eyes. Um, my genetics are from my parents. Those things aren't changing. They're just not. Just as someone who, let's say, has a severe um, blood disorder from birth, or let's just say um, Down syndrome, for example, as far as I know, and as far as we know, there's, there's certain genetic things that just you can't change. But then there's the things that we can change. And this is where the term neuroplasticity comes in. We used to think, for instance, that if someone had a stroke where they're having some kind of neurological deficit or they lose their speech or their ability to walk, that they're just like that forever and that can't change. And we now know through the world of neuroplasticity and many great pioneers in that world um, that we can rewire the system. We can take something that is now um, hardwired, so to speak, and rewire it and shift it due to this plasticity of not just the brain, 
but the nervous system, the physiology, the, um, the structures of our body, if we think about working out, right? Working out is such an interesting one in that our form follows our function. So if we are not well in our physical fitness or our aerobic fitness or our posture, we can actively change those structures we can rewire what seems to be hardwired quite simply. Of course, it requires the drive and the commitment to do so, but we can change these things. The other example I'm going to give with um, this concept of hardwiring, um, I'm going to give you an example and then I'm going to tell you the story that this podcaster had shared or the vignette. Um, in the world of trauma, often we think of trauma as something really big and bad and scary. And one of the ca classic examples, while that's true, we also know that more insidious, low-level chronic stressors can be traumatic. Again, that's for another day. But one of the more classic examples would be this. A soldier is on the battlefield and they get blown up and they survive. And in that um, attack, in that explosion, um, they are put into a shocked state they might see things that are really intense and horrific. And then they come home and they are then diagnosed what we would say is PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the classic example is the war veteran sitting at a restaurant and in the parking lot, a car backfires really loudly and they jump. And all of a sudden they have floods and flashbacks to being on the war zone field, seeing all this bad, scary stuff happen. Now, back in the day, and through some forms of, let's just say, therapies, it would be said that that is hardwired, that that is just the way that person is going to be for the rest of their life. They're going to have to cope with this post-traumatic stress reaction when something similar to that event 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 10 years ago, a year ago, um, that it's still embedded. But through the work that I and my colleagues do, namely the work of somatic experiencing and Peter Levine and all the branches around that, we know, I know from watching sessions and working with people who have these um, kind of flashback somatic reactions, that we can change that, we can rewire, we can reprogram, but we can't just do it cognitively and we can't do it behaviorally because if we think about that example, if I use that as a proxy, when that person is blown up in an explosion and they survive, they don't see it coming. They can't prepare for it. They can't orient and process what's about to occur. It just happens and the system can't make sense of it and then that's how that trauma gets stuck in the system and then of course, Typically in such a situation that that soldier continues on or they're brought into the medic area and they're they're saved um, and then they probably get put back home or convalesce and do other duties, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There very rarely is time to process and as I said in my first statement, we only are hardwired to the degree in which we understand how to work with this stuff. So in having watched um, war veterans work with one of my um, teachers, Peter Levine, they are talking about the incident, but they are, they are framing it in a very titrated, drop by drop, slow paced way and going into all the human somatic experience, not just the visuals, but the feelings, the tensions inside, the emotions, the movement that maybe they couldn't do to protect, um, the grief at seeing their comrades blown up, the survivor guilt, um, all the things. There's actually a beautiful set of videos done. I'll see if I can find it and post it in the show more section here with Peter Levine working with a man by the name of Ray. And he was in this case in an explosion with an IED and came back and had PTSD, severe troubles with anxiety, um, headaches, and these ticks, these little, little ticks that when you understand stored trauma at the somatic level, they were his, it was his system in that shock pattern of that explosion. 
Okay, so I wanted to lay that foundation to just give you another example and tell you that this kind of stuff can be rewired, but it has to be done at that full scope level in relationship to all the contexts that go with that, that um, event, that trauma, and then where the person is now in their body, in their physiology, and then breaking apart piece by piece by piece all of the elements of human experience internally, but also how that person orients and connects to their environment, their relationships, their memories, and these autonomic reactions that are stored in the body that are trying to get out. All right. So if I go back to this uh, vignette that this podcaster uh, shared, uh, and I'm going to rephrase it and summarize it, but essentially he was talking about how he heard this story about a woman who, when she was a teenager, would um, go off with her friends, or maybe it was her siblings, um, and they would smoke, smoke cigarettes while riding horses. So for whatever reason, and I mean, most kids don't openly smoke cigarettes in front of their parents when they're teenagers. So they're, you know, sneaking out to do this without the parents knowing maybe there was something going on that was stressful in the life. Who knows? They go out, they get on the horses, they smoke cigarettes to mask the smell of the cigarette smoke. Um, and then I'm just going to assume that the parents didn't know about it. Fast forward to when this woman was a mother herself and she had, let's just say a teenage daughter or a daughter old enough to get on a horse. She thought it'd be great to take my daughter out riding, which is wonderful. And as soon as she got on the horse, she wanted to have a cigarette. Now, apparently this woman didn't smoke um, throughout her adult years, but the moment she got on that horse, the feeling of that horse, probably the smell of the horse, the way the body is positioned, it reminded her of that connection to that chemical, nicotine, but also the act of it probably being with her friends or her siblings and kind of getting away with something if you wanna add that one in there. And so the assumption would be that that is hardwired that you can't change that. Therefore, don't start doing something when you're a teenager that is bad for you because you're not going to be able to get rid of it. Now, again, that statement I said, we're only hardwired to the degree in which we know how to work with that hardwiring. If we were to, if I were to sit down with that woman or someone who's trying to change um, maybe the emotions or the cravings, they, they may not know how to get deeper into the physiology. And so for example, let's just say I was to sit down with this person and work with them, I would want to ask more questions and have her inquire more with her body around what was going on in that time in her life when she was a teenager. Was there stress in the, in the, the, the home life? Um, who was the person that she was with? Um, all the little nuances of what was going on around the act of cigarette smoking. Um, we might break down, you know, maybe we would find, and of course now I'm just making up some scenarios, maybe um, the home life was really stressful and she didn't know how to bring her nervous system down through being with the connection of the family because the family was toxic. So that nicotine, that cigarette being outside calmed her. And of course, we know that that's what these, these drugs do. It brought the system down. Um, it calmed it down, or maybe it gave it a little bit of a boost, right? Um, and so we would maybe work with that quality of what was happening in the home life, not while she was on the horse, not while she was smoking, but to see what is under that. Remember how I said behavior, biology is driven, drives our behavior? What was going on in her biology before the cigarette smoking happened? What was going on in her biology in that time in her life? And then we might work with what does that craving feel like? Is there something inside that is bubbling up? Is there some kind of soothing that she can remember feeling in her gut or in her chest or in how her acuity and her eyes changed? We might work with 
orienting in the moment to bring in that 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 visual um, input that has her remember certain things. Now, I won't go into all the specifics because we don't know what that would be like because every single person is different. But if we take this from a more somatic experiencing point of view, this more um, biochemical, but also relationship to the sensations, the feelings, um, the level of expansion that maybe was felt when that, that drug came into her body, and maybe the level of contraction that she felt before she went out, we might play with what are other things in your life that make you feel a little more expansive, a little more open, and what are some things in your life that make you feel more contracted and more stressed. And it might have nothing to do with the cigarette smoke. I would want to find different things to shift that wiring. So um, I just really wanted to, to paint that picture because a lot of folks will think, well, I have this addiction, I have this um, behavior, I have this way of being, and I just know, know, because of what people say about hard wiring, that it's never gonna change, I have to cope, I have to manage, um, I'm never gonna get a horse ever again, because every time I do, I just wanna have a smoke. We can shift those things, but the shifting has to occur at this multi-dimensional complex level that is more than the mind and the thinking and the behavior of it, but all the other elements of how our entire physiology responds to that concept, to that behavior, and then also looking at what was happening at that time in the life that may have sparked that desire to have to calm down and bring the nervous system down or bring the nervous system up. So I hope that has given a little insight into behavior, biology, um, these things that we think are hardwired in our system. Now, having worked again myself with many folks who have had very severe injuries, for example, neurological in injuries, um, very addictive behaviors, I know firsthand, and um, I'm thinking about one story right now that I'll post below, um, where this wasn't so much a craving with a drug or a behavior, but it was a physical injury that we thought was in the physical body, namely frozen shoulder due to broken ribs. Um, I have written about this, it's called, I call it the story of Grace, um, one of my very first clients, where she came to me with severe frozen shoulder and it had, no, it had nothing to do, again, I say this with air quotes, with the actual injury, the ribs and the shoulder, it had to do with trapped memories at the somatic tissue level from when she was very young um, and survived just horrendous abuse um, where her arms were tied down. But then as an adult, something sparked the need for her arms to be tied down due to this injury with her ribs. And then all of the physiology bubbled up such that it tried to protect and it went into intense fear and shutdown response. The story is a pretty good one. I'm not gonna go into the details now, but suffi su suffice to say that that is something that you can check out to just see another example of how we might think that that's a hardwired structural thing, such as frozen shoulder, and it has to be worked manually, but really what needed to be worked at or with was this deeper neurophysiological memory, somatic, environmental point of view. Again, I share that again to just prove a little bit of a point that when working with physical things, neurological things, recovering from something, behavioral stuff, we have to go to all the different levels. And of course, to work with that takes a little bit more time. It takes a little bit more practice. It takes having the right tools in place, the right understanding, the right somatic therapist, the right practitioner, um, all those things have to be in place. But the interesting thing is that when we take a little more time to bring all the elements together, the shifts and the changes and the ability to rewire the hardwiring gets a lot easier. All right, everyone, thank you for listening to this video. Leave me your comments. If you have questions, please post them below. My team will get back to you and answer them. And as I mentioned, I'll post some other links and resources below so that you can learn a little bit more about this concept of neuroplasticity, um, 
hardwiring, how to bring in all these aspects of our somatic experience so that we can heal and really at the end of the day, not have our biology drive our behavior. All right, take care. We will see you next time.